Hello. Uh, it's a beautiful uh, Brisbane afternoon, and it's great to be here. Um, I moved to Queensland with my husband about five years ago, and uh, we're told by the locals that we have to stay at least another 15 years before we're remotely considered Queenslanders. <laughs> and I, I think with this accent, that's never really going to happen. So um, consider this a kind of global view, global citizen view. And, and in actual fact, um, my father, who was a Hungarian and uh, migrated to Brazil after World War II, where I was born, um, raised us on science fiction. So he was actually raised on Jules Verne, and I was raised on Isaac Asimov and, you know, uh, that. So this talk also is about kind of imagining the future and how amazing it is that sometimes uh, it comes true. Uh, it's also about inertia. That's really the fundamental theme. And uh, imagine how hard it was to, um, to get up this morning. Well, uh, that's the power of inertia, you know, kind of cutting through all of that. Um, I'm the kind of person who can be uh, unbelievably kind of shifted in life through small tidbits that I hear. And I was listening to Radio National's uh, science program uh, to Robin Williams a few years ago, and I heard this small tidbit, and it just completely shifted um, how I think about being uh, kind of on the planet, you know, in the 21st century. And it was a, a tidbit that came from a guy called Nate Lewis, who's an emeritus professor in chemistry at Caltech. And although it's kind of long, I'm going to read it to you uh, because it made me just jolt. So he says, you see, the Earth has a 35-year thermal inertia. And so what we're doing now is only beginning, only the beginning, because we're waiting 35 years to even see what the effects are that we did 35 years ago. So it'll be another 30 years until we really start to see even at the 380 parts per billion level of CO2 concentration in the atmosphere, um, what the effects actually are. And by then, we'll be at 550 parts per billion and um, could even be more. So there's a big debate uh, about whether it's bad, very bad, not so bad. Uh, but the key thing is there's no turning back. So I thought about that, and I thought, wow, 35 years. You know, 35 years ago, it's 1975. <laughs> That's a photo of my mom, <laughs> who's extremely hip in Mexico with my cousin, who's, whose name is Booby. That's true. <laughs> and, and me and my sister. And, you know, we had around 4 billion people on the planet. Um, if you look at this little uh, graph on the bottom there, you can see that uh, you know, there were about 330 parts per, actually that's billion, there's a bunch of typos here, of concentrated CO2 equivalents in the atmosphere. And uh, it was a very, very different time. Uh, big hair was more in. <laughs> that hasn't really come back to my great distress. But, uh, you know, when you imagine that the industrialization of China and India hadn't happened, that we didn't have flat screen TVs and multiple levels around developed countries, and that what we're living with now in terms of the impacts query, whether they are just weather patterns or a reflection of the growing impacts of climate change, whatever it is, it relates to decades ago of what was in the atmosphere. So then it occurred to me <laughs> how incredible, you know, we can pump out these emissions and it only hits us in 2046. Like that's a pretty amazing reflection on um, what it is that we've been doing, and this habit um, called fossil fuel emissions, uh, plus deforestation and, you know, a number of other drivers, and how difficult it is to understand cause and effect when there's a delay period within the Earth's climate system. So, you know, a bit of a pickle. <laughs> and it kind of gets worse before it gets better. Because if we start dieting today, <laughs> we're only going to lose weight, begin to actually see stabilization gradually decline a thousand years from now. So, you know, this discussion we've been having in Australia recently about incrementally pricing carbon, investing in, you know, renewable energy, that's a 5% discussion. It's a 5% discussion on the beginning of a path. You know, if, if it were the yellow brick road, we're Dorothy, and we're just taking the first step, okay? We haven't even met the Tin Man. And here's the pickle. So I hate graphs like this. I especially hate them when they're really big. <laughs> but y y you'll see really clearly, you know, what the consequences of this pickle uh, actually 
are. So today on the left-hand side, um, you can see that that brown line, which is the CO2 emissions and growing in the beginning, we hope will peak. This is a very optimistic scenario. This is a scenario that imagines, you know, Dorothy gets to Emerald City. <laughs> we may or may not get there, but under this scenario where we manage to contain the peak and actually, you know, flatten out into future centuries the concentrations of, you know, greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, we are still stuck with temperature increases of a few degrees. Now, that doesn't sound very dramatic. You know, what's two degrees, three degrees, four degrees? Um, if you listen to the risks that our climate scientists, particularly here in Australia, where we're kind of on the front line of these impacts because we are a coastal community and, uh, you know, we're surrounded by the sea, those small in impacts, gradually rising seas, gradually rising temperature that will stay with us actually have dramatic consequences for our communities, human development, particularly for developing countries. I don't have to tell you guys this. This is such a rabid debate in Australia right now uh, for biodiversity. And so as we wean ourselves off and move towards new technologies and different behavior, we're going to have to live with those consequences and hopefully minimize them and go on this kind of shift in eating <laughs> without really seeing the consequences um, other than through the models, which, you know, are difficult to visualize. So we're in a race, and the race is against the inertia of the climate system. And um, there are some really interesting aspects of that race. So, you know, when we talked about globalization 10 years ago, we talked about the free flow of capital and how markets were intertwined and currencies were now tradable and, you know, people began to travel and so forth. Um, what's happened now with the advent of uh, the digital world is globalization is becoming very, very personal. And in a sense, if, if the single organizing principle behind globalization as we learned about it was nations and how they behave and trade and sort of, you know, reach out into a global economy. The single organizing principle of this new digital age is networks. It's us and how we're connected. And civil society is way ahead of governments in understanding that. And I think it's pretty obvious that over the next 100 years, 150 years, we will reorganize the way in which we govern ourselves as these personal human networks grow. The other really interesting thing is um, this new generation of kids, I think they call them Gen Z, have a really interesting set of values. They're traditional in that sense of um, family and conservation and simplicity. Uh, they're highly environmental. They're driven by humanitarian values. And they're a lot more interested in happiness than they are in shopping, um, which is going to be really hard, I think, for <laughs> the advertising industry. But, you know, it offers you, I think, a bit of hope. Um, we find ourselves in a time where the rate of discovery, just sheer discovery of our natural world through science and patents and, you know, the connectedness across disciplines has never been faster, and it's exponential, which means the curve grows like that. And I had the privilege for a couple of years before moving to Queensland uh, to be CSIRO's Director of Business Development, so I had the great fortune of seeing Australian science, you know, across all these disciplines come together to offer solutions, you know, applied solutions. It's really quite extraordinary. And the other thing which <laughs> offers hope, and I'll talk a little bit about, is if you want to watch how markets develop, watch where the early stage capital is invested. And if you go to Silicon Valley today and you talk to smart people and you look at where the really high-end VC firms are invested, it's in clean technology. It's in third generation solar voltaic, it's in geothermal, it's around network solutions that will tap into markets that are rapidly growing in developing countries. So those are four things I want to chat about briefly. One thing which, in the context of all four of those things, I find really fascinating. Around this time last year, CSIRO did a big survey on attitudes towards climate change. And remember, we were heading into a federal election that was highly polarized, 50-50, you know, line ball call. And it turns out that so were our attitudes. 5,000 people surveyed around the nation. 50%, 83% of Australians believe that the climate is changing. <laughs> so everyone agrees that we're beginning to see these changes and something is happening. Uh, with our weather and our climate, it's just that 50.4% of the public believes that 
Mostly it's human induced. Whereas the rest believe, no, it's just changing its cycles, its sunspots, you know, don't know, don't care, but you know, not quite convinced uh, that we're um, you know, really helping to cause the situation and therefore can become part of the solution. So the thing that really captivated me was if you look at who people trust, the gray bar, the people that believe it's happening but natural, so skeptical about you know, the fossil fuel bit, and the green bits believe that it's happening and they're absolutely terrified and they see what's, what's driving it from, from their perspective. And where they overlap is they trust their family and friends. So, you know, we have to reach out now across these personal networks to start taking these steps down this yellow brick road. And it occurred to me, <laughs> this is pretty embarrassing, this is my Facebook page. These are, this is the sum total of my friends. And it's embarrassing to put them out there. It was very funny when I did this. It's just a bunch of screenshots cobbled together. There are about 500 people that I've kind of accumulated as Facebook friends. And I realized that I didn't know where 134 of them lived. And then I realized I didn't know 35 of them. <laughs> so these are really close friends. <laughs> but you know how you know a friend of a friend, I met you at a conference, blah, blah, blah. You never connect. And so you think, well, there's some kind of level of connectivity. Well, look at what happens when you take this little Facebook app and you actually link to where your friends are. So because I'm from South America, educated in the US, living here now, you know, spend time in Europe, each one of us, if we dive back into who we are and reconnect going forward, is beginning to build these networks that are quite large in scale and scope. Now, the new generation coming through, actually, when the World Wide Web went live, uh, was in 1990 on my birthday, on August 7th. I thought that was kind of special. And this Gen Z are kids born after 1990, and look at their values. They're altruistic, they're digital natives, they are returning to traditional values. They're concerned about social justice. They value the environment, and they have a strong spirit of humanitarianism. So these are the kids that are confronting this challenge that's ahead. Another source of hope is this notion of the rate of change. Now, Ray Kurzweil is a futurist from MIT, and he studies this, this rate of discovery that's happening. This is a staggering fact. At today's rate of progress, everything that was discovered in the 20th century, from cars to electricity to, you know, digital communications to airplanes to you name it, could be compressed to 20 years. And because it's exponential, because the discovery is happening on top of other discoveries, the 21st century itself will achieve 20,000 years of progress at today's rate. So, we don't know what's ahead. As we confront these impacts which are built into the system with a new generation of very, very different values that are sort of moving through and capturing the challenge, we will have a whole bunch of uh, new, new technologies. And, you know, I'm not one of these people that believes that technology is going to solve everything, but I am one of these people that notices how quickly everybody buys an iPhone, right? So if we reach out over these networks and try to catalyze that kind of connection around new technologies and also shift around those values of conservation and simple living and happiness while having the comforts of life, you have to think that there's a magic there because we're so connected and we're trusting each other about the steps that we take together. So that's the next hurdle that we, uh, we need to get over. And this is um, the, the real kind of, you know, interesting um, reflection. Um, I started my career, uh, I studied economics at university, and I had this really, really interesting first five years of, of my work experience. Um, I started in New York uh, in the 80s uh, with an investment bank called Morgan Stanley. And I worked in their M&A department, their mergers and acquisitions department. And it was a pretty full frontal kind of place to, um, to work as a young woman who, you know, didn't really have uh, a family background of investment banking, but just wanted experience and exposure. Uh, I worked on defending a large uh, oil and gas company from a takeover. Uh, I worked on selling a chewing tobacco company. <laughs> this is not the stuff of a greenie. <laughs> I really cut my teeth in this very different kind of climate. And I had the real privilege of being transferred to Morgan Stanley's San Francisco High Technology Office. And there, they advised from Apple Computer to HP to Silicon Graphics to all of the early hardware software companies, uh, the companies that were really working on 
um, you know, connectivity and networks. Uh, and we took them public. We got to meet the entrepreneurs behind them. We got to understand their ideas. And so I got to meet people like Jim Clark, uh, who was the founder of Netscape and the founder of Silicon Graphics. And when you ask Jim, how did Silicon Graphics, you know, how was it born? And he says, well, I just could see that this machine could create this graphic interface that would let people do things that they'd never done before. And he was so passionate about it, he, you know, borrowed money from his neighbor, built a prototype, you know, left Stanford University, went on this journey, and lo and behold, you know, decades later, we have things like Pixar, and we can watch animation. I mean, the level of discovery that happens, not just in Silicon Valley. Here in Australia, we have one of the world's leading photovoltaic research groups. And there is a controversy about, you know, whether we should be manufacturing solar panels here or we just so-called lose the technology to China. My, my view is it's a good thing because we are global citizens, we have a global problem and we have to solve it. We have to bring our, our strengths and capacities to that equation. And if the Chinese can half the cost of solar panels for my rooftop by manufacturing at scale, and if our technology is driving that, I think that's a wonderful thing. And of course, we should have royalties for it, and we should create more synergy and investment across borders, but it is a very exciting thing. And I guess that's my, my point. Today is very different than the early 80s, when the mid-80s, when, when I was in Silicon Valley, or at the university system in SARA and so forth here in Australia. Today, clean technology is where the incubation actually is. So that, that is a very, um, a very exciting thing. Um, I was so happy when Steve Jobs had this vision of buying the Beatles catalog for Apple. I just thought, wow, this is really cool. You know, this whole new generation of kids is going to realize how fantastic these ideas are, uh, you know, about friendship and the sun and, you know, all this other stuff. Um, growing up, when we went for uh, night walks, my father was um, an amateur astronomer. He founded Brazil's Interplanetary Society. And in fact, in our backyard, <laughs> there was this huge telescope that you know, everyone would come to and debate what was happening with the stars. He then went on to um, uh, translate for Yuri Gagarin's first tour to Latin America, which was very, very exciting. He used to show us an onion when we were little kids. And he'd say, you know what? You've got to remember. Human beings, we've been on the planet for 200,000 years. The planet's been here for four and a half billion years. We're not even that brown skin on the edge of the onion. We're a tiny little pimple on that brown skin on the edge of the onion. And, and that's what we have to be mindful now. It's not just our kids, it's the onion. So I hope that together, with a little help from our friends, we can beat this inertia. Thanks.